it's good to see so many of you back again and um, this afternoon Shelby will be talking about asking good questions when we're listening. She's already mentioned that that is a key part of helping somebody, helping reflect back to somebody that you really are listening to them, that you've really heard and understood them. So um, I'll give it to you, Shelby, and you can take it away from here. Thank you, Shirley. It's good to see everybody again today. Day three, you've made it. I'm impressed. Well done. Um, we kind of started out, you know, day one really looking at trust, which was maybe not what you expected from an active listening seminar. Um, however, as we saw, and in, in, I'm sure amongst our processing together, we began to understand how important trust is to building relationships and how listening well to someone and helping people feel heard actually helps build trust in a relationship. Um, and, you know, yesterday we looked at some more practical tools of, you know, active listening and, and had some practice. And today we are going to uh, talk about how to actually ask good questions. Now, asking good questions is like, I legitimately brought like a visual aid. Oh, it's a key. Yes, it's key. Asking good questions is key to helping people feel heard, helping people feel understood, um, and actually understanding people's stories. So where there's misunderstanding or where, you know, there's just kind of, you don't know what's going on. Being able to ask a well-timed and well-aimed question can actually just open up everything that's behind the curtains. Now I've mixed my metaphors behind the door, if you will, to, to what people are feeling. So I'm really excited to give you guys some really practical tools that I have learned and honed over a decade of counseling people and leading people and working with people. I hope you guys find it helpful as well. So we are going to watch a video. Um, Shirley, if you can bring that up about the ultimate question. Um, yes, the ultimate question. Seven and a half million years waiting. And she was like, you didn't ask me the right question. Why is it important to know how to ask good questions? I want to tell you guys a story about my children. So my son is almost eight and he's precious. And my daughter is five. And my daughter is like a little bit of a negative Nelly, we say. Like, you know, you, she wakes up in the morning and you're like, how'd you sleep? And she's like, oh, so bad. Like I had a bad dream. And and then you're like, okay, like after that bad dream, like, how did you sleep? Oh yeah, fine. You know, how was your day at school? Oh, it was bad. Why? I don't know. It's just bad. Like she's so negative. And the other day she came home from school. She was happy. She was having a good time. And uh, I sat and I said, um, so, hey, how was your morning? And literally her face started to crumple like, hmm. And I go, what was good about this morning? <gasps> we played, we did this, we did that. It was so great. <laughs> I was like, why, why? She's so negative. And being able to ask a question that asked her to focus on the positive was the thing that actually helped her to give me an answer and help her realize, okay, yes, there was good things that happened. It was crazy. I was so shocked just because, you know, I think, how is your morning? That's an open question that invites conversation, you know, but she was so just like, hmm. well, actually. So I have found that even in interacting um, with my kids, that making sure that I'm asking them helpful questions, good questions, 
um, can be helpful. I remember telling my son a couple of years ago, he's so funny. He's a sponge. Okay. And he will soak up anything, anything. He wants to know it all. I mean, he is a huge know-it-all, but I kind of don't blame him knowing who his parents are. I mean, he genuinely wants to know everything, how everything works, how to be the best at life. And I remember telling him um, a few years ago before he started school, or maybe just when he started school, I said, you know, there are no stupid questions. Like the only dumb question is the question that's not asked. You know, I said, if you can learn now to ask questions, like you will have learned one of greatest, like life's greatest skills to ask questions, you know, be curious and, and find stuff out. <laughs> and so he has fully taken that like into his little almost eight-year-old heart. And I remember his teacher, I think it was last year, we had our first like parent teacher, you know, conference and we're like, how is he doing? And she was like, yeah, he's, he's doing well. He asks a lot of questions <laughs> and he'll like interrupt her. in like the middle of a story and be like, what's that word? Like, what does that mean? Like, what's that thing? And she was like, yeah, that's, it's, it's good. I'm just not used to it. I'm not used to having a kid asking so many questions. And I was like, I feel like I'm winning at life right now. If my son is like getting his teacher just from asking all of the questions. So why is it important to know how to ask a good question? Because you never get all the information in the exact order and the depth and the detail that you would prefer. That's why the chief tool of a good listener is a good question, okay? So we can reflective listen, we can you know, reflect back to people what we're hearing, we can help them feel that we're engaged and you know, present. But if we don't know how to ask a good question, you're gonna reach a point where you are dead in the water. You know, if you, someone's sharing and you're, mm, yeah, you know, using the power of the, mm -hmm, and, you know, open and engaged and like you hit a point where you're just like there and then they're like silent and then it's an awkward silence and you don't know where to go from there. So questions will help you to not get stuck. A well-crafted question can actually stimulate like a process with somebody if they feel stuck, you know, like I'm not sure how I'm feeling. I don't know what's going on. Uh, you can draw people out. <laughs> um, I am an introvert. Me and my husband are both introverts, but I am an external processor. He is an internal processor. Now, when we started like eyeing each other across the room, I did not speak a lot of French and he did not speak a lot of English. However, that was not going to stop me. So I would go to him and just start asking him questions about himself and his weekend and things like that. And I remember a couple of years after we got married, you know, I was doing the wife thing. Like, why do you love me? Like, tell me why you fell in love with me. And he said one of the biggest things was actually that I was able to draw him out with my questions. And he felt like I was interested in who he was. I mean, not just his very nice farmer muscles, but actually who he was. And that was something that was so impactful for him. And I remember thinking like, thank God I have the skill because that's how I got my man. Very exciting. He's precious. So you can actually help draw people out with your questions, um, which can be great. Even people, I have a woman who's now like one of my best friends. She's from Finland. And when she came to our base, she did not feel confident in her English. Uh, of course, she felt very lost in the culture and you know she wasn't really comfortable and I just started to ask her questions about Finland 
and was, you know, asked her about her culture and, and asked her, you know, how it is at home and how things are different. And um, that really, she felt drawn out and she felt cared for because somebody just took the time to ask her some questions and invite a conversation. You can also use questions to guide discussion. I think Jillian mentioned yesterday, you know, what do you do when you kind of get stuck with somebody who's maybe struggling to finish their story or to kind of come around to a point, asking a good question can help guide a discussion. Uh, we did talk a little bit yesterday already about the difference between internal processors and external processors. So being able to work with an internal processor and asking the right questions um, can actually help draw them out and, and get what you need and help them to process. Sometimes it's hard as an internal processor where you're the only one, like it's, it's just inside your head. As a verbal processor, I can share my story with 30 people and get 30 different, you know, opinions and then have a lot to go on. Um, internal processors don't often have that same capacity to do that. So it helps to draw people out. So we are going to go to a breakout room now, a process breakout room of 10 minutes. And I want you guys to talk about, you know, how do you feel about asking questions? Um, what are your strengths and weaknesses in asking questions? Okay, so we have got a fair amount of info to get through. And I have kind of split it up into some really practical tools that will help you um, in crafting good questions, just very, very practical things. And then I've got some more information. So things that you can kind of keep in the back of your head as you are kind of growing um, this practice and you know working through this and that kind of stuff. So we're gonna start with the tools first and we'll have a practice time together and then we'll focus on the rest of the information. All right, so here's a few tools we're gonna talk about, oh, number one, knowing your purpose and knowing your role. And we talked about that a bit yesterday about what is your role as a listener in the situation and in learning how to ask good questions, knowing that role is gonna be important. So what is your purpose? Every question you ask should get either information or an opinion. Are you asking for information? Are you asking for someone's opinion? Like you're, you know, you're wanting to get information from that person or you're wanting to know what they think or what they're feeling as an opinion. Um, and knowing which kind of information you need will help you frame your questions accordingly. Okay, so one thing that um, I have found annoys many other cultures. So I am American and I am Swiss. I feel very half, half, like there are so many Swiss things about me that people just laugh. Um, but one thing that I have found can bother many other cultures from my American culture is, hi, how are you? Just asking people pa in passing, how are you? Oh, well, hi, how are you? How are you? And the feedback has been that it's like, well, you don't really want to know. You're just like just saying it, like, why are you saying it? Why are you asking me if you don't really want to know? I'm like seeing a few heads nodding that like, yes. Um, and the only thing I can compare that to is I think it's in like Vietnam or somewhere where they ask you like the greeting is to say, oh, have you eaten? And like, if someone asked me that, I'd be like, yeah, like why? But it's just this greeting. However, there was someone, a friend of mine that came by the other day who is going through uh, a pretty rough situation. And I opened the door to this person. They were unexpectedly at my house. And, you know, they had something for me. I was like, oh, thanks. And I'm like, hey, how are you? And he was like, uh, and I was like, different question. How are you feeling right in this moment? <laughs> he was like, good. Like, oh, wonderful. 
So how are you it can be a really loaded question. Um, and I have to be aware of who I'm talking to and what I'm actually asking for. I did not have time to sit down and, and hear how he's actually doing. Um, so I really needed to adjust my question for what I was wanting to know from him. I wanted to know how he was doing in that moment. So I had to change my question. Um, the next tool is open conversation, okay? I genuinely cannot stress this one enough. There is definitely a time and a place for closed questions, particularly when you are coaching someone um, and you're trying to help them get to a certain place um, and formulate a plan of action, that kind of thing. There is, there is a time and a place for closed questions. Um, However, those are usually very specific instances. Um, so open-ended questions actually invite someone to talk. It's an invitation. And that helps people feel heard. When you are, it shows your interest. It shows that you're genuine. Asking an open-ended question actually invites discussion. And particularly for member care providers, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We really want to know how people are doing and we really want to know how we can help them. So open-ended questions are key. It's gonna help you gather a lot more information and, and a lot more understanding as well. So when you say something like, uh, you know, what do you like best about this space? Or even better, you know, how has your experience been? That is actually going to get better information than, oh, do you like this space? Did you like this school? You know, something like that. You're going to get a yes or no answer or maybe a, like a shrug. Like, I don't know, kind of thing. Um, another tactic actually is to ask the question in a declarative format. This can be really helpful for internal processors. Okay. So tell me how your experience has been on the base. That actually helps internal processors focus their response. Instead of saying, how was your experience on the base? That can often freak an internal processor out because it's like, well, it was good and it was bad and it was horrible and it was awesome and it was cold and I was hungry and you know, whatever. If you say, tell me how your experience has been on this base, or tell me how you're feeling today, that actually creates a safer like guardrail um, for a lot of people because they feel like that's a targeted question. Okay, so it is an open question. Um, it's not a closed directive, it's an open directive, but it is a directive. So it's good to know as well your audience who you're talking to. If you're not sure the person that you're talking to, if they are an internal processor or an external processor, or maybe they're just speaking a language that is not your own, um, sometimes that declarative, if you're asking an open-ended question and you're not getting the information, try a declarative format. The third tool, one of my favorites is use neutral wording. So I've got some do's and some don'ts for you guys. I have seen in the past, um, of course, all of us do this at some point, um, when you people ask a leading question. <laughs> so, you know, how'd you like the DTS lecture phase? Wasn't it amazing? Like that's a leading question because you've expressed your own opinion about the DTS lecture phase or whatever it is. Um, it's like when, you know, women ask their husbands, does this make me look fat? Oh, dangerous, dangerous question. Because maybe you already feel like this makes me look fat, you know? And so he's like, he's got to lie right? Like there's no chance. If he says yes, like he's in trouble. So not asking leading questions. You got to stay neutral. Um, it's just unproductive. 
isn't it? You know, to ask, ask a leading question because you're not going to get the information that you need. Even if that person had a different opinion from you, they are not likely to share it with you because they feel like you've already made up your mind and that makes you feel like an unsafe person. So it's like, well, if, if I differed from you, um, then yeah, it was fine. And that's it. And you're not actually going to be given space to influence in their life or to connect with them or whatever. So you've got to be careful. Um, sometimes when you ask a leading question and they'll be like, oh yeah, sure. It was, it was fine. Why not? Um, that person hasn't actually altered their feelings. Like you've not convinced them that it was awesome. Uh, it's just that he hasn't expressed them and you lose that opportunity to influence. So a neutral question that elicits accurate information or an honest opinion, such as, well, how did you like it? Or how was that for you? Is gonna be much more useful. Wanna to talk to you guys about how, what, and when. Okay, so these are the do's. Do ask these questions. You do use the neutral wording of how, what, and when. So how did you feel about that? What was it about that situation that annoyed you? When you were experiencing that, how did it feel? So starting a question with how, what, or when is going to lead you down a good path, <laughs> or at least it's going to lead you to an open path. It may not feel good. You may get you know bombarded with a ton of crap, but it's definitely going to open a conversation for you guys. Now, one of my biggest pet peeves in question asking is when people say, how did that make you feel? Please don't ever do that. Please, I beg you. Don't ask someone how that made them feel. When you say, how did that make you feel? You take the responsibility of that person's emotions off of them and you put it onto the other thing or the other person. You know, when your husband said that to you, how did that make you feel? So I have now taken any responsibility for my own emotions and I've put it all onto my husband. You know, when your leader, you know, made that decision, how did that make you feel? That takes all the responsibility off of you for your own emotions and puts it all onto that leader. So it's something that is, well, we all do it. We've all done it for sure. But in trying to help people, particularly from a member care perspective, when you want to help people get down to the root of what's going on in their hearts, in their minds, in their lives, it is unhelpful to put the emotional responsibility onto somebody else, okay? So every time you ask, how did that make you feel a fairy dies somewhere, okay? So just don't do it. Um, help people take responsibility for their own emotions or their own feelings. Oh, all right, the don'ts. Don't ask questions that start with why. Now, why is an intellectual question. It stimulates an intellectual process instead of an emotional process. There may be, again, if in a coaching situation or something like that, there may be space for a good why question. Um, but oftentimes, especially in member care, we are actually trying to connect with people emotionally and help people connect to their own emotions. So what's going on with them? What, why are they feeling that way? That's a question you can ask yourself, but in order to get that, if you ask them, why are you feeling that way? <laughs> they're not going to know. That's why they're talking to you because they need help figuring that out. So just be aware that why stimulates an intellectual process instead of an emotional one. So depending on your role, 
and the speaker's goal, you know, if you're in a coaching situation or something like that, a why question may or may not be helpful. The last don't word is a do question. Do you? Oh, those are actually closed questions. So you're going to want to stay away from that if you're trying to gain more information or gain an opinion from somebody or feeling from somebody. So oftentimes when we think about asking questions to somebody, you know, we're trying to help them figure out what's going on. And so a do question most naturally comes out because that's often a question that we use in our everyday life. But do is a closed. So I cannot tell you how many times, especially as I started practicing how to ask good questions. I'm sitting there, I'm listening to somebody. <laughs> I'm like trying not to formulate a question in my head ahead of time, right? Like I'm trying to listen and really be engaged. And I'm like, ah, mm. <laughs> like I start to ask a question and I have to. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? <laughs> like, I swear I'm not choking on air. I'm just trying to formulate how to ask a question. So if you guys can begin to cut out the do from your question vocabulary, that's going to help help you. Okay, so those are the three kind of big tools that will actually help you begin to formulate questions you know, knowing your purpose and your role, um, opening conversation, and asking questions that invite discussion, that open it up to people, and making sure to use neutral wording. That's gonna help you become a trustworthy member care provider. If you're not asking leading questions, you know, putting your own opinion and your feelings out there, it's going to make you feel like a safe space. So we're going to go to a breakout room and practice using these tools. We've got 20 minutes. You know, you guys can share a small story with each other. Again, um, use something if you feel like, oh gosh, I don't have something, you know, fresh and new. Use something that you've used in the last two days. That's fine. Um, and listen to each other and try to ask some questions, some open-ended questions, and then talk about it. You know, how is that? And uh, then switch and we'll come back, have a bit of feedback about that, and then go to coffee break. Okay, so before we have a coffee break, um, I would love to hear some feedback from you guys. In regards specifically, to how do you feel your listening or asking questions has changed from the first practice that you did on day one until now? We kind of talked about just with the last questions now of not saying, do you, or how does that make you feel? Kind mm -hmm. of both just made us think of those questions only. <laughs> yeah. And so we were just like, uh, what can I then ask? <laughs> And so, yeah, and then we're a little bit blocked and like, so we ended up processing a little bit more like, mm -hmm. what is the issue with those questions? And yeah, so a little bit back and forth on that. And what did you come up with? Well, I guess intensely, because I think I struggled more with the do you questions, like I, I could, where I followed the, how does that make you feel and how that is not necessarily taking ownership. Uh, but I could see the do you question ended up being more closed. But at the same time, I have not often felt bothered by being asked myself, did that make you feel or do you think? Because then that helps me navigate to say, no, I didn't feel misunderstood, but I felt frustrated or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So still verbally processing or finding mm -hmm. out. But yeah, that's kind of some of the. That's good. Thanks, Isabel. I'm just feeling like I'm more able to think through how to ask good questions now. I think maybe I had a block <laughs> on not really knowing what kind of questions to ask to keep the conversation going. What do you think, Dana? So if I ask you guys, 
how did that practice make you feel? Versus how did you feel about that practice? Can you maybe begin to, to see the difference in your response? Just when I'm thinking about it right now, like thinking of the term, how did that make you feel? It's almost like that's a more pressured question than how did you feel in that? Mm. And so I don't know if that's just a me thing where I'm thinking that, but yeah, how did you feel in that seems a lot more free and a lot less pressury than how did that make you feel? Maybe it's even just the presence of that phrase, make you. Mm. Yeah. But now I'm rethinking of all the times I've spoken with people in the past and that phrase has definitely come up like, oh, how, how, how did that make you feel? Yeah. Oh, Ashley, different now. Something I have found helpful is to when people describe something, I say, what, what was going on inside you? Mm -hmm. what was happening inside you and then the thinkers can say what they were thinking the feelers can say how they felt and those who feel it in their bodies you know they can say oh it gave me a headache or they, they can they've got a whole breadth of the five senses they can go to mm -hmm. or they can say well I wondered where God was, I felt abandoned by him. That you, they get can have a spiritual response, as well as a physical, intellectual, or emotional response. So it's it's just one of those things that helped me get out of channeling them mm -hmm. was just to say what's going on inside, what was happening inside them. Yeah, it's really good, Charlie. Thanks. I think the phrase "How did that make you feel?" feels like something hit you or like something has been done to you. And if you say, well, like, well, sorry, now I can't think of it the other way. Mm -hmm. It's like, how did you feel in that moment? Mm -hmm. It feels like I stepped into something. Like I had a choice in the matter mm -hmm. um, that I have done something or I have, I have a little bit more control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I found definitely in my counseling practice, people come faster to the, the point of healing and the point of understanding their process when they're owning their own emotions instead of putting it on somebody else. You know, when your husband said that those pants make you look fat, how did that make you feel? Like that was like, well, he was so horrible and he was so mean and like, I can't believe he said that and that kind of stuff instead of saying, well, how did you feel when your husband told you that those pants make you look fat, you know, then you're like, well, I felt really bad. I, I felt, you know, fat or I was so shocked or whatever. And it actually, I find just as a counselor, being careful about that helps people go much faster to the root of the problem than actually kind of doing this dance around the exterior things that are affecting them. So like Jillian said, like it's actually instead of things happening to you, you can own, you have space to say, well, this is how I felt in that. And that can actually help people get much quicker down to the root of what's going on, which is what makes it a great member care tool. We are going to get into some more information. Now, I know I've already given you guys a lot to think about, hopefully. For some of you, this may feel very basic. For some of you, this may be a bit like, oh my gosh, how have I been doing this or not doing this all this time? Um, but either way, I've got some more to share. Okay, so we looked at a few tools, very practical things in how to ask good questions. And now I'm going to give you guys some things to basically ruminate on, think about um, that will help you as you begin to practice this more and more. Um, it'll be things that you can maybe begin to think through um, and incorporate into just how you listen and how you ask questions in your own practice or in your own member care work. All right. So the first one is you've got to speak your listener's language. Obviously not like literally speak their language because <laughs> that would make no sense. 
Um, but you do want to relate your questions to the uh, person's frame of reference um, and use maybe words and phrases that they understand. So for example, uh, those of us who have worked in YWAM probably understand YWAMEs. You know, I did a DTS. Oh, what's a DTS? We love our acronyms in YWAM. Everything. Everything's an acronym. And then you just like start to guess. And I'm like, what does this mean? <laughs> um, so be aware of, of that, things like that. Um, also, if you are, for instance, very highly educated academically, sometimes you can begin to let some of that language creep in. Uh, to your questions or just into how you're interacting with somebody. Um, and I find particularly when you're speaking with someone who does not speak the same first language as you, you have to be aware of that. So if I'm speaking, my native language is English. If I'm speaking with another native English speaker, I can use bigger, fancier words if I feel like that's going to express, you know, the question better. But if I am speaking with someone who's an English second or third language speaker, then I have to be careful with that. Um, and also then being aware of the reverse. So for instance, when I speak French, like my French is not that bad, but I get really like blunt because my French is fairly simple, if you will. And I go away from some of these conversations with my in-laws <laughs> or other people where I just, I feel like I'm very like abrupt because my language is so simple. So if you are listening to someone and you feel like they're being very abrupt or maybe very direct, remember that perhaps they're speaking a second or third language or fourth. Um, and so you can adjust yourself accordingly. Um, if someone doesn't seem to understand what you're asking or what you're saying, you can try rephrasing. Um, speak simply. You can speak simply without being so direct. I know some of us come from very direct communication cultures. Um, and some come from more indirect communication cultures. Switzerland is actually very indirect, I found. Like, goodness, there's the nuance. It's like, wait, so when you're saying that, what are you meaning? You know, it's very, very indirect kind of around um, the thing. So when I'm, for instance, speaking French with somebody where my French is much more simple, I can still find a way to be indirect um, in my communication with them. So no, again, it's just knowing your audience and, and speaking their language. You know, where are they coming from? As a listener, as a, a question asker, that's how we should be positioning ourselves. You know, how can we help the person that has come to us for help? There is always, always room for gentleness, grace, and love in our communication. So even if you're from a direct culture and you may be listening to someone from a very indirect culture, you know, always remember that there is always space, regardless of how frustrating the situation is, um, of how frustrated maybe you feel where you're trying to understand somebody and trying to help somebody, there always has to be space for gentleness, and grace and love. And that's how we build relationship. If you're not carrying that that day, you know, if you're having a crap time and you're exhausted or you're just really frustrated because of a situation or anything, hey, do the loving thing and remove yourself from that position, from that situation. If you need to say, you know what, can we reschedule? Like I've just not slept in three days and I'm feeling it or, you know, I'm PMSing. Sorry, Hannah's, you know, like anything that is just, you're having a moment, it is okay. It is much better to reschedule 
um, or to say, hey, can you go talk to Janice? Because she is just fantastic and she will be kind to you today and I'm struggling. So remember, please, please always give yourself and the other person space for gentleness and grace and love in communication. I think as cross-cultural and cross-generational workers, this is something for us to be very aware of. Like, you get the us older folk, older folk, you know, that's maybe working with the younger generation that can feel really frustrating. Like, I don't understand them. Small plug, if you're struggling with, you know, cross-generational communication, you definitely want to sign up for the February seminar. Um, but if you hit those moments of that frustration, we're very, very in it, aren't we? Cross cultures, cross generational. Be aware of where your frustration points are so that you can actually extend extra love and grace in those moments. All right, the next one. In your questions, you can start wide and then narrow it down. Okay, so start wide and narrow it down. You're building a hierarchy of questions that kind of can begin with a big picture and then gradually drill yourself down um, to what you're, what you're needing, to specifics. Um, I think it's important to not assume that you know what's going on. So <laughs> sometimes uh, you'll maybe see someone that's just lashing out at other people um, you know, and you're like, oh gosh, like, well, something must be wrong with them. And so you can go to them and either say, you know, Hey, how are you doing? Or what's going on? Like, that's a really broad question, right? You start wide. What would be a mistake is to say, Hmm, I just saw Hannah's shout at Heidi. And I know that he's really been having some struggles at home. You know, his kids are going crazy and, you know, they're in transition. And so he must be struggling with that. And so if I go to Hannah's and I'm like, hey, I know transition is really rough for you, but you can't just shout at Heidi. Like, and he's like, what are you talking about? Like, Heidi slapped me. I don't know. You know, that it's, you just can't assume that you actually know what's going on so start from a wider situation i see this happen a lot um particularly maybe in discipleship situations where someone has been walking alongside someone and maybe discipling them and you see that person either lash out or uh give you like a really abrupt response or send you a really harsh email or something like that and because you've maybe been discipling them and been walking with them, you maybe assume that you know where that is coming from. Don't assume that you know where that is coming from. Start with a wide question and you can narrow it down and see. Is, did you know where they were coming from? Maybe, but we don't guarantee that. Um, actually asking a question of how are you doing or what's going on there is going to give them an invitation to talk. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna always open, open the space, invite people to share. Um, one thing I am really bad at still, after all of my years of experience, <laughs> is filling in the blanks for someone. I think I do this a lot as I often work with um, English second or third language speakers. And when someone is searching, they're pausing and you can tell they're searching for a word or a phrase or a feeling. And I want to prompt them <laughs> and offer, oh, so, oh, it's so horrible when you're like, so you're like frustrated or, you know, annoyed. And they're like, no, <laughs> you're like, oh. Sorry, sorry about that. My daughter, who's five, Chloe, she gets so angry, like from the time she was probably three. So she's three, 
she's growing up speaking two languages. <clears throat> and so she's searching for a word, you know, she's speaking English to me and she's searching for a word. And I know I, she's three. I know what she's trying to say. <laughs> and so I will say it. She's like, stop interrupting me. <laughs> like, she is, she is so character. Um, so I do find that I do that a lot working cross-culturally, but don't fill in the blanks. Be careful um, about that because you may start to lead somebody um, or you, they may just feel like you're not listening. The next one is you want to focus your questions, okay? So they ask one thing at a time. This can be helpful. Um, if you really want to know two different things, ask two different questions. So have you ever had somebody like dump a story on you and you don't even know where to begin with that? shenanigans that they have just bleh. anybody no just me yeah a few hands okay good not totally weird it can be overwhelming as a listener you can feel like okay where do I start with that um so if you want to know something about this part of the story ask a question about that part of the story if you need to know then, you know, what happened <laughs> with section B, then you can ask a question about that. Um, if you get that dumped on you and you don't know where to begin and you just get, you start really like, okay, so what's the problem? <laughs> you know, they're like, well, I just told you six problems. Like everything is a problem. My life. <laughs> Um, so if you're trying to help them process through something, choose one thing at a time. All right. And the last point, follow the speaker, follow the speaker, be less concerned about your own agenda. And I think oftentimes as member care workers, we have a legitimate agenda. You know, we're trying to help somebody, um, maybe process through a particular thing especially if we've been walking with somebody consistently, you know, towards a certain goal. Um, but you have to actually let them lead the conversation. So kind of following them in that, um, it can sometimes take us off of a planned path, um, particularly for verbal processors. Verbal processors will do this a lot. We rabbit trail, like, we go over here and then we go over here and then we go over here. And then, or if you are from a, a culture that expresses or communicates in a circular fashion, instead of along a linear fashion, um, it can feel like if you're from a linear culture, processing with someone who's from a circular culture, it can feel like you're getting dizzy. Um, but follow the speaker. So if you're just trying to hammer through your own agenda, they're not gonna feel heard and they're not gonna come back to you and talk to you again. Um, and following them will help conversation flow because they're leading it, they're on a rabbit trail. It doesn't make sense to you, but it makes sense to them. Um, you can actually use something in their answer to frame your next question. So trying to get honest feedback about how school has been running, right? Well, how was the DTS for you? Like that can go into a lot of rabbit trails, right? Um, but you can bring it back in with a well-timed question. What you do is you reflect back. Okay, so I hear you saying that when you went into that evangeliz evangelization, like that that was really cold and you really hated being cold. So yeah, yeah, I totally hated that. Okay. So overall, how would you say you're feeling about the DTS? You know, like you can use something in their most recent <laughs> sharing time, reflect back to them so that they feel like, yes, you're tracking, you're hearing, and then you can bring your question back around. So you can follow them as they're processing 
and bring a well-timed question to pull it back onto the main path. All right, that's my info for you guys. What we're gonna do now is go into our last breakout room of our time together. And I would love you guys to actually process together, you know, maybe some things that you feel like you've learned over the seminar. So when we process together, we kind of debrief together, it helps cement certain things um, in our learning process. So I wanna give you guys some time to do that. We're just gonna take eight minutes. So not a super long, space but since there's just two of you hopefully that'll give you a few minutes to just reflect and say okay what is it is there is there anything that i've taken out of the seminar that feels like i'm going to use is there anything i'm still concerned about so you guys can just process that and then we'll come back together and hear some feedback from you well i hope that was fun for you guys um, I would love to hear some feedback from what you guys just processed together, you know, what things have kind of stood out to you, um, or what can you walk away with after this seminar in being challenged or just in learning. We learn from each other, you know, we learn from hearing each other's stories. So feel free to share and help somebody else. Shelby, I've really enjoyed this time. Um, just getting to know you, all of you all and talking with you and that kind of thing. So it's been a real good time of, as, far, as far as that. But then um, also trying to push myself in asking questions. Mm -hmm. So that's been really helpful to me. All right, thanks, Dan. I think something that really stood out for me was like, I've always heard, oh, ask good questions, ask good questions. But then when the time comes, like, I'm so busy active listening or working hard on that, that I lose myself when it's time to ask a question. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this gave me a really good structure on how to ask effective questions without being distracted while I'm trying to active listen. Nice. I really liked your teaching because it's very much alive and I feel that you love teaching and it's simply yours. Uh, and I, I also love that I always was together with the same person. Mm. So um, we, we didn't only learn how to ask questions and stuff like that, but we also got to know each other. And that was very, very life-giving. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's helpful to know there are other people out there doing the same work, hey? I'll tag onto that to say that it's nice that it was the same person for the whole day instead of, you know, having to introduce yourself constantly and like we do, but you actually, like you said, they got to get to know people, which was really nice. Anybody else want to share something? Yeah, I, um, I enjoyed having different persons every day because I got to know um, different people. I, I had a, I got the feeling that maybe some of you knew each other. I, I didn't know anyone here, so that was good. And um, I'm, I'm getting into the world of member care. So for me, this was a, a good place to start. And I just, especially about listening, active listening. I am one person who struggle with listening because I talk a lot. And so um, being challenged to be intentional and deliberate, to be a good listener and, 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 and to actively do it, for me, that is um, a take home. The issue of trust, um, we, we deal with trust issues very different in Africa. Um, about being vulnerable and all, it's not something that comes as easily as in the West. <laughs> so I'm, ex I'm excited um, to just see how this works out as I get involved in member care. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Nice, nice meeting you all. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. It's been really great to have you. Yeah, two things for me really stood out. One was just you, Shelby. 
and just I'm just delighted in you in the last two days. So sad I missed Tuesday. It's just been great to see you being authentic and real with who you are and, and teaching and something that I think is quite a difficult subject because we all like talking, whether we're internal or external processes. And so just the way you brought that was, was really, really good. Um, and I think the other thing that really stood out for me uh, these last two days is the importance of knowing your role and not just that you know it yourself, but you get to say to that person, what do you want from me? What, what is, so it kind of avoids that whole being dumped on. If you say to them, you can ask them that question, what do you want to do with what you've just shared? Um, and just the freedom that it, it brings. And I think you said, you know, it, it, you listening is helping somebody, yes, but it also has to help you. Mm-hmm. And just that, that side gate that's there, if the conversation becomes unhappy, mm-hmm. you don't have to listen to it. You can say, okay, let's, let's stop, let's do something else. And that was really good to hear. Good. Thanks, Ruth. Okay. I just wanted to add one small thing Hannah's mentioned, um, as you guys were in your last process group, you know, he was talking about the importance of setting margins um, in your day and in your time. If as a member care provider, you are talking to a lot of people or you are listening to a lot of people, um, it's, you do often get dumped on or, or can feel that you're caring a lot. Um, and it is important to set those margins in your day. So, you know, I mentioned like, if you're just not in a space where you can hear somebody, it is okay to say like, can we reschedule or, you know, can you go talk to somebody else? Um, But also just as a general practice, making sure that, um, you know, after I have a client, after I have a counseling client, I don't schedule the next one right away. I take time to decompress, to make my notes and actually release all of that to the Lord because I can't carry that into my next session. I I have to release that. And it's important to give yourself space as a member care provider to release the things um, that you're maybe carrying for these people. So I love that that Hannah has mentioned that just about the margins and making sure that, that you're not you know, carrying all of your stuff. So I just want to thank you guys so much for your time and attention. I feel really privileged to have had the opportunity um, to share with you guys and to, to get to learn from you as well. So thank you so much. I know we've seen some of you many times and some for the first time. Um, either way, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Um, and Shirley has just a bit of info for you guys before we part ways. Thank, thank you. you guys. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see some of you again. And we always enjoy seeing familiar faces back with us. So happy listening. And uh, I hope that you're more confident in how you listen and ask the appropriate questions in the future. Thank you very much.